Welcome to uh, this version of our podcast, What's the Score? Let me remind you that if you enjoy today's podcast, or any of our podcasts for that matter, to please press the like button on whatever format you're listening to the podcast on. Also consider supporting us by uh, joining us on patreon.com and show your support for the program that way. There'll be details to follow in the middle of the podcast. Once again, thanks for listening and enjoy today's terrific interview as well as some amazing film music. Today's program made possible by patrons like you. Welcome to where we celebrate music from the movies. From the golden age to present day, we've got it all covered. We talk to those in the entertainment industry and find out about their favorite scores. You found the podcast, What's the Score? I'm your host, Frank R. Wilson. So sit back, relax, grab a popcorn, and let's see what we'll be hearing today. Recognize that music? It's a favorite of our guest today. Uh, He's actually a a Canadian composer that has many credits to his name. Not only credits, but has gotten numerous nominations from various organizations for best music during his young career. He's worked in film and TV for the CBC, HGTV, Disney, and many more. He also composes music for numerous video games and commercials. So I hope all of you will please join me in welcoming... Peter Chapman to the program. Hi, Peter. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. I'm really glad to have you with us today and looking forward to talking with you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And I'll try to avoid any kind of Canadian jokes, eh? <laughs> Bring them on. <laughs> hey, I used to go to school in Michigan with a couple of Canadians, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with it. Anyway, um, I really appreciate you being with us today and looking forward to talking about your career and hearing some of the music that you're going to share with us. Um, I, I'm just kind of curious as a kind of a way to get started, I'd be really interested in learning more about you, the person and, uh, you know, growing up and family and, you know, where did you live and all those sorts of things. So if you wouldn't mind, just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia on the East coast of Canada, pretty, uh, smallish city. Um, definitely not one of Canadian's uh, Canada's bigger cities, um, but beautiful nonetheless. Oh man, I love it. I, yeah. I miss it so much, especially in recent years. It's just it's gotten it's gotten incredible. Um, so yeah, I, I I was born there in 1980 to uh, two lovely parents. My dad was he cut his teeth playing in bands in the 80s. He oh, toured. Wow. Yeah, he like toured playing like in cover bands and stuff back in like sort of the 70s, 70s and 80s when you could actually make a a living doing that. That was his career, and then uh-huh. he. He managed to pivot uh, in the early eight, early to mid '80s and started managing a music store in uh, Halifax called Music Stop, which became ultimately kind of the East Coast music chain. Huh. Um, and then my mother actually worked in TV and film. She was a wardrobe designer, so she worked on a. There were like pretty much if there was a production coming out of Nova Scotia in the eighties and nineties, there was a very good chance that she was working on it. And mm-hmm. if she wasn't one of her best friends probably was. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I grew I grew up there, uh, sort of did the, uh, the piano lesson thing when I was a kid. My dad was, uh, was pretty insistent that I learned piano at a young age, um, which I begrudgingly did. Uh, <laughs> <and then> eventually, <laughs> yeah, Can I interrupt you for a minute? It was interesting. Yeah, of course. Because, 
my wife wanted to push my daughter into learning piano, and I said, no, if she's interested, fine. If she's not, hey, come on, let's don't push her. But, you know, okay, you know, as usual, the wife won. Um, and uh, and so she took piano lessons. But I, I think, actually, ultimately, it was a it was a good thing. So I'm kind of curious, was it, I mean, obviously, for your career, I guess it was a good thing. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I definitely did not enjoy it, you know, getting up every morning. I think the the main thing was that I was playing music that I wasn't particularly interested in. You know, mm. there's a lot of classical music and all the kind of classical standards that kids learn. Um, I remember at one point learning a Brian Adams song on piano, and it was like the most exciting moment. <laughs> like, I, I was I was elated that I got to practice this song. And then eventually, to drive my dad crazy, I learned how to play it on his accordion, and I would follow him around the house playing <laughs> everything I do, I do it for you on accordion, <laughs> just, uh, just to be a jerk. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that was, and you know, I did that, but then there was... You know, 1992, Nirvana plays, they perform on uh, Saturday Night Live. And that was like, uh, that was a, a, a real, uh, that was a, like a, you know, a, a real moment for me when I saw that. That was sort of Beatles, Ed Sullivan kind of change of paradigm for me. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got really interested in guitar. Um, and so I lived in Halifax until I was 19, and then I moved to Toronto, Ontario to go to design school because my, funny enough, my dad actually, he didn't want me to be a musician, even though it was, you know, my passion, it's all I did. He was very concerned because having been through the music industry and having worked in a music store, he kind of saw the, the other side of the the darker side of being a musician and oh, how, yeah. dif how difficult it was. And, and I think he was concerned. He didn't really want me going down that road. Um, so for some reason we all agreed that me going to art school for design was a better alternative, <laughs> which is, I think, you know, marginally more, a marginally more employable skill. Uh, so I ended up going to the Ontario college of art and design and, uh, that was where it all started to really fall into place. Um, you know, I was taking design, but I was looking around at all of my design colleagues and realized uh, there was a moment when I realized I was going to be competing against them on the workforce when I got out of here. And they were all way more into it than I was. And I just wanted to go home and write music and play music and record music and produce music. And I knew at that point, I was like, this probably isn't the correct uh, trajectory for my career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it can that can be a tough realization to have. I'm sure when you're studying for one thing and you're thinking, eh, I don't know if this is my cup of tea or not. But yeah, I mean, like I enjoyed it, but I just knew I was. I've always sort of been the kind of person that's always looking, you know, five, eight, ten years ahead, and looking five to ten years ahead in that career. I just I didn't think I was going to be happy, so. I ended up making a pivot around then, and there were, there were a Here lot Here we of, are. Uh, yeah, a yeah. lot, lot of lucky breaks and uh, serendipitous moments between then and now. But Yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll talk about those in a moment. Um, it's an interesting background. And, and uh, Any brothers or sisters, by the way? Yeah, uh, yeah, I have an amazing sister named Ainsley, who uh, she, was, she was great growing up. She, had, she was kind of the older sister that was constantly turning me on to cool music um and by turning me on to it i'm i really mean i would sneak into her room and steal her cassette tapes and, <laughs> she, would get, and she would get very upset with me and sometimes i would tape them before she would notice uh but she was she was a pretty great influence she also there was also a moment in when i was in high school where she was dating a guy named michael booth who is now a a uh, a really great chef in ontario but huh. he he had an amazing cd collection and this is like you know, 1996, 1997, where your 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 worth as a person is how good your CD collection is, <laughs> and, he, and he had an enormous CD collection, and he would always loan me these CDs and kind of turn me on to new music. Huh. And uh, that was, I remember that was a great summer for me. I, I learned. Well, and, and, and you're showing your age a little bit by even mentioning the word cassette. I mean, yep. probably some of our <laughs> listeners say, what the hell's a cassette? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
That's a great. That's a great backstory. Great backstory. We, uh, you wanted to share a bunch of uh, music that you've composed for various projects, and I wanted to sh- start off by sharing one of them right now. Uh, I guess a recent project that you're working on is uh, called Working Moms, and the cue you wanted to share was Working Moms Make a Mix. Uh, tell us a little bit about why you wanted to choose that amongst uh, your favorites to share today. So that one, I mean, that one is sort of a funny one because uh, Working Moms. The, the style of cues, the style of cue that typically happens in that show is it's a lot of these sort of shorter stings uh, that can last anywhere from, you know, five seconds to 15 seconds. Um, so they're not really things that necessarily stand alone, but they often have these, you know, I love the ideas that go into them. And I always, often kind of wonder, like, what some of these would sound like if we flesh them out into a proper song. So, uh, so one day just for fun, I took, I think I took like the, what I would sort of refer to as the greatest hits, which were cues that everyone on the production team loved and, uh, and kind of mashed them up into this like minute Mm -hmm. and a half long, almost like a DJ mix. So you can kind of hear them all kind of mixing in and out of each other. And it, I don't know, it, I think it, it, it is a good representation of the style of music that we composed on the show we being myself and uh the awesomely talented maylee todd uh who co-composed this show with me okay well let's uh let's have a listen for ourselves this again from the film working moms and it's called the working moms mega mix and it's written by our guest today peter chapman get out of my way get, get out of my way yeah get out of my way get, get, get out of my way So it's obvious that, um, based on what you were telling us, that you had a real interest in music and being a musician. That's quite a bit different from being a composer for film, TV, video games, and commercials. So tell me about uh, tell me a little bit about your transition from being a just you know a mu- I, I'm, I'm sorry I don't mean to minimize it saying just a musician okay. but you know what I'm saying yeah, of course. a transition from a musician to being a a composer for film, TV, and so on. So, yeah, so there was definitely, there were a few moments, there were a few key moments that kind of pushed me into that world. So when I, once I moved to Toronto, my first job was working in a used musical equipment store called Paul's Boutique, which is still there. It's an awesome, awesome store. If you're, if anyone's ever in Toronto, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, And working there... You know, we sold guitars and amps and stuff. I met pretty much every band member of every Canadian band, <laughs> uh, you know, that existed between, you know, 2000 and 2010. And I saw, again, I saw, I, saw, I personally kind of saw the, the, the dark side to being in a band. And I would see a lot of these musicians in these bands, you know, on their way up and they would be on the cover of magazines and everything would be blowing up and everything was fantastic. And then it would dry up and now they're, you know, in their forties and they have no job experience. (laughs) And now it's, and it became like a struggle, you know, and I, I saw, and a lot of my friends struggled with this too. And I saw it when I was about 20, 21. And I remember it scared me. I was like, man, I don't think I want to be in a band. Like, I don't think this is a realistic uh, future for me. Now, around that time, there were a few different things that happened. One was uh, there was there was a, a, a commercial company in from Toronto called Imprint. They uh, they sadly closed up shop a couple years ago, but th- um, the 
oh, I forget his name, but the owner of Imprint used to come in, and one day he told me I could come down and visit the studio. Cause, and they wrote commercial music. They wrote, uh, like, jingles and such. Right. So I remember going and seeing this studio and seeing them work, and I brought my demo, <laughs> and, and they were, you know, so... Uh, kind <laughs> when they play when i played it for them it was like you know my demo was definitely not up to snuff but i really thought like oh this could be like the turning point but i remember this is my ticket yeah. this is my ticket you know yeah this is my big my my big opportunity but they were you know they were really kind and we, we we talked and they were really encouraging and i remember thinking at that point music for commercials that is like success that is how you make a living doing you know writing writing music being yeah you certainly can yeah now the thing was this is also you know 2000 2001 when selling out was not cool Mm. yet like like now it's a respectable thing to do you know a band gets their music in a commercial and everyone's like nice like good for them 2000 2001 a band put their music in a commercial and you know they lost a lot of respect and i think that was And that was something I, 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 I was just sort of over. I was like, you know what? I don't care. I will write whatever people want me to uh, for these commercials. I, you know, this is, I think this is, this is my, the way I can actually make a living. Now, again, I was like, I was 20 or 21 years old at that point. And then I also had this amazing moment at OCAD where I took this audio course from um, a fantastic teacher named Tom Third, who is a Toronto-based composer. Uh, who actually just won a Canadian Screen Music Award, a CSA. So uh, congratulations, uh, Tom. And um, he showed us a reel of a bunch of commercials that he had worked on. And I was floored at how cool it was. And that was another moment that I was like, this is what I really want to do with my life. Um, No, the fascinating, where it, it started, where I managed to pivot into television from that, was about eight years later. So for the next eight years, I'm writing commercials for a local company. Mm -hmm. Uh, About eight years later, Tom, my audio teacher, was working on a series called Durham County. And he had done season one, but he couldn't do season two because he'd gotten hired on a show called The Listener. And he couldn't, there was going to be overlap and he couldn't do them both. So he and the music supervisor who I had been working with both said, like, you should get Peter. He could do it. And... They both kind of shoved me in front of this producer and it was a real trial by fire moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I had a meeting and I managed to get to land the gig. And that was my first TV series. And it was stressful. (laughs) Well, let's let's listen to another cue that you had chosen. Uh, I believe this is from a project called, let me make sure I got this right. Winona Earp, is that how it's called pronounced? Yeah, Winona Earp, yes. And and the the cue is called Access Denied. Tell us a little bit about why you wanted to share that today. So this this was one of those shows. It was when I was working on Winona Earp. First season of, of this show was when the light bulb really went off in my head. Because this show, the, I worked with a fantastic composer named Rob Carley. We we both we tag teamed the show together, and the producers were really encouraging, um, in terms of us really pushing the limits and going as far out as we wanted and that let us really explore and do a lot of really crazy stuff on the score and this particular cue uh was one of those cues and so what's actually happening is in this scene they're switching back and forth there's some people that are in this room they're running out of air meanwhile it's it keeps cutting back and forth between the people that are running out of air and then the people on the other side of the door who are trying to get in uh to, to save them essentially and you can hear in the queue it's it cuts you can hear where it's cutting back and forth between the two scenes and i treated them both very differently so one of them is a little bit more comedic because they're fumbling around on this keypad and no one knows how to like how to open the door and then it cuts back and these people are on the verge of dying okay and, uh, i got okay. to use a lot of weird synthesizers and orchestral stuff and it's it's a pretty intense cue but it's one of my favorites of the show Excellent. Well, let's uh, have a listen for ourselves. This again from the film Winona Earp, and it's by our guest again, Peter Chapman.
So you're, um, I gather from our conversation, you're you're based in Canada. I think Toronto is what you had told me, right? Correct. Yeah. Now, I, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but I I think it's pretty safe to say that a hotbed of film and TV production is probably in the U.S. and in the U.K. Mm-hmm. So, th- does being based in Canada does that restrict uh, uh, opportunities for you, or is it uh, or not? Um, you know, it's in some ways yes, and in some ways no. So, this has been a struggle for me because I I've been considering the move to Los Angeles for years. My wife and I love it there. We spent three months there in 2017, and. And it, we've been wanting to to make the jump for ever, pretty much ever since. Uh, <laughs> not that I don't love Toronto, but I just love California. I love the weather. I love Los Angeles. I I love it all. Um, now the thing is, is if you're if you are in Canada, um, it it is there's a pretty huge film and TV industry here. And there is actually, I'm aware of that. Yeah. Yeah, and so being part of that, it's it's tough because. You know, I'm I'm fairly well ingrained here. Uh, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not struggling for work. Uh, so I have a lot of connections here and a lot of relationships here, and a lot of productions that or a lot of producers that hire me on shows. So, you know, it's it's hard to want to. Le- it's hard. The idea of leaving is scary. Um, Understandable. But then the idea of like going to Los Angeles, you know, I would kind of be starting from the bottom there you know it's you can't really just roll in with some canadian uh even a show like working moms which is recognized uh you know internationally it'd still be hard to kind of roll in and just be like all right i'm here hire me you know well, you, like, you know the phrase that occurs to me is that in toronto you were a big fish in a small pond in la you'd be a small fish in a big pond does that make sense yeah no abs- that's absolutely the case and a good friend of mine kind of described the la composing scene uh, he described it as a series of like various mob bosses. So it's like <laughs> you've got like you know your Zimmer camp and your Junkie Excel camp and your Danny Elfman camp, et cetera, right. et cetera. And if you want to work there, you're probably going to have to come up through one of those camps because because kind of cutting out a little section for yourself is pretty difficult. Um, I bet. You run then you run the risk of just becoming, you know, a, a, a career assistant, which I would never want to be. And honestly, I'm kind of at a, like, I don't really want to be an assistant at this point in my career. So, I mean, we have talked about what it would look like if we moved there. Uh, now, the thing is, is that borders are, you know, it's pretty blurry these days. I've worked on pr- on American productions from Canada, and it hasn't been a problem, especially since post-COVID zoom technology has gotten so good boy no kidding um, yeah yeah there, i don't know that i necessarily need need to be in los angeles to and to to land american gigs because i'm already kind of landing them it, for me i think it's more that i just want to be surrounded by palm trees <laughs> no but i agree with you i mean that's kind of what i've heard from some of the other guests that it's these days given technology and whatnot it in all honesty i mean it doesn't really matter where you live or where you're at. You can you can still you can still get gigs and you can still produce the product that you need to. I mean, you may have to uh, go to an LA or something like that to conduct an orchestra or whatnot. But uh, as far as for composing and actually getting the work, it you know it's times have changed. Yeah. So I mean, that's understandable. Totally, and it's not like you'd have to twist my arm to go to LA and conduct an orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had an opportunity to do that? No, I haven't, sadly. Um, best, I, you know, again, with one of the things about Canada, too, is our budgets aren't quite the same as American uh, American productions. So we don't... It's rare that you get an opportunity to record full orchestras here. Uh, there was an episode of The Lake recently that I worked on. Uh, it was the finale of... Actually, I probably shouldn't say too much about it, but uh, no, d- I don't. Then, ha- if you're uncomfortable, that's fine. No, 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 no. I, I, I don't want to give away the joke, but because I don't know uh, the if it's come out yet. But I did have the opportunity to record a string section here in my studio for that, which was 
really funny and well it was fun and funny because the the (laughs) whole sequence was a pretty comedic moment um and then once in a while you do get the opportunity like i do have friends who will get the opportunity to hire an orchestra here or there here and there but most of the time they're they're hiring one in like budapest uh which is kind of the it's kind of it's a it's a you, it's a maneuver you, you, you know what I, I if i may i'm sorry to interrupt but i'll i i want to ask you about that but let's 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 save that for a little bit later okay because sure, I, sure. I think it's it's an important discussion to have and i'd be curious about your thoughts on it sure. uh, one of the other cues that you chose was from a, a project i believe it's called the happy house of frightstein right happy house of frightenstein frankenstein pardon me um, and, so it's and like a it's like Frankenstein, but fright. Happy House of okay, Frankenstein. Yeah. The uh, the cue is called Montage Demo. Tell us a little bit about your uh, thinking on wanting to include that amongst your favorites today. So the Happy House of Frankenstein, a little bit of background, is it was originally based on a show called The Hilarious House of Frankenstein that was produced in Ontario in the late 70s and early 80s. And it was this low-budget kids comedy horror show that essentially became a real uh kind of cult the cult the campiness got a cult following and it started like adults and college students started watching it because it was so bizarre and the theme song to that was march of the martians by uh i believe it was jean-jacques perry which was a kind of a weird synth pop record from the 60s And so the sound of this score was very much influenced by that. So I have all my analog synthesizers wired into this, and it's sort of a a hybrid of uh, kind of slightly out of tune analog synthesizers and orchestra. And this was a demo I originally wrote for the producers saying, you know, I think this is kind of the vibe we could go for. And we all liked it so much it ended up in one of the episodes as a <laughs> montage so uh so yeah, if you hear it if you listen to it you can hear all the kind of synthesizers kind of plugging away against an orchestra and it, this was a really fun kids show to do it's a cartoon it's it's available on youtube if anyone wants to check it out Happy okay House well excellent it's uh let's have a listen for our, ourselves this is from the film happy excuse me let's see happy house of frightenstein and it's written by our guest peter chapman I noticed that you uh, you, you composed mu- music for all sorts of things, film, television, commercials, but I also saw you listed uh, that you've composed music for video games. Now, I'm kind of, you know, and all right, all right, full disclosure, I'm like in my 60s. I don't play video games, okay? So I don't know anything about, about what music and video games would be. Tell me a little bit about, it, it, is there any difference in how you approach doing music for a video game versus a film or TV? And perhaps there isn't any, but I'm just kind of curious if there is. No, there absolutely is a difference. Uh, The two main ones is the, uh, I would say, the schedules are very different. Film and TV, you generally have a very short amount of time to, to write the music. Whereas for video games, you don't have to wait for a locked picture or anything like that um you can often start writing you know as soon as they have concept art before they've even started programming the game wow so that's so that means you can sometimes have like a year two years now also video some video games will require a tremendous amount of music so you might still be very busy during those two years but the deadline is generally much further away 
The other thing is most video game music um, is interactive and has certain technical specifications that you have to work with in order for it to implement properly in the video game. So, you know, I worked on a game a while back called uh, Mod Nation Racers and the, th the way that game worked was I had to write these three and a half minute long cues that would loop, but then it had to be delivered in stems so that all of the stems could slowly remix themselves over the course of the game. So there was some randomness involved in it. So certain stems would be mixing, but then also depending on where you were in the race, if you were in first place, all the stems would be playing. If you were in last place, it might just be the drums. And then as you slowly got to the front of the race pack, more stems would come in and the music would get more intense. Mm. Um, and so it, so figuring out how to do that was, can be, things like that can be pretty, pretty difficult. Uh, Cause each one of those stems had to exist on its own. You ha it had to work. If you were just hearing that one stem, it had to support the video game, but then you also had to have them all playing together and have it work as well. W would I be safe in assa assuming that, Maybe unlike a film or a TV project, that with a video game, it, the music is like constant, it's continuous, never stops? Yeah, I mean, the video games I've worked on, there's very rarely any moments where there's no music. As a matter of fact, on Guacamelee, the only point where there isn't music, there's about a one minute point where there's no music as you're approaching the final boss of the game. And the lack of music during that moment is actually incredibly impactful because oh yeah it can be yeah totally everything's so quiet and you're like where's the music what's going on and you're walking along and you know something bad is about to happen and it's the first time the whole game there's no music so you know you know you kind of know you're at the end when that's happening mm -hmm. wow so, yeah. well it, it, I, I i'm interested in in the you know it's it's interesting you're able to commercials very finite very short amount of time to get your idea across musically and then you got film and tv which is entirely different and then video games where you've got to kind of like stretch it out i mean at the the variety that you've uh, been able to work in your career is quite impressive so that's my congratulations to you on that thank you i've always you know i to me i love the challenge of kind of fa like faking it almost like <laughs> being f being forced into a new genre and uh and having to kind of dig your way out of it um even guacamole you know i'll be perfectly honest I i've told this story a few times but when i had that meeting with them and they're asking me if i can write mariachi music you know i had never written mariachi music before <laughs> but uh you know, I convinced them. They didn't them. have to know that. Well, I didn't really mention that. And I, you know, I, I put on a brave face and convinced them I could totally do it and it would be fine. And then, you know, I spent the next uh, few weeks watching lots of YouTube videos and uh, listening to a lot of music and researching the different uh, the different instruments and eventually uh, got confident enough to come up with a score. And, uh, and it worked. Excellent. Excellent. Well, an, uh, another piece you chose was from a project, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce this, uh, SkyMed? Is that how you say yeah. it? Yep. Uh, the cue is called Bear Attack. Tell us a little bit about why you wanted to choose that today. So Bear Attack, <clears throat> so SkyMed is a, a, a show about um, a bunch of pilots and medics in northern Ontario that are in a, er, that are in a very rural area, and um, they basically have to fly to these... Uh, emergency situations fly into these emergency situations and save people mm -hmm. uh and so you know someone might get attacked by a bear someone might have gotten frozen in into the ice there's all sorts of like crazy things that happen um and this is the first cue of the of episode one of season one and it was actually the cue that i wrote when we pitched on the show so uh i wrote this alongside um Rob Carley also who I worked with on uh, work and moms and again it was sort of it's a hybrid of really fast high energy percussion uh, orchestral you know lots of orchestral instruments and arrangements but then you also get like some really cool synthesizers a, a vintage Roland 303 
which is like a really cool synthesizer from like dance music world and uh it all kind of comes together um at the and then at the very end you hear the sky med theme so yeah okay. I, I i like this one partially because it was the the cue that landed the gig but also because it's the first cue that you hear in the whole series excellent all right well let's have a listen for ourselves this is from the film called sky med the cue is called bear attack enjoy We'll get back to our program in a minute. This program is done for the love of film and film music, plain and simple. However, it does take a huge investment in time and in fees for me to make the program work for you. And I don't sell commercial time and don't really want to on this program. Rather, I'm kind of like a, a public broadcasting station. I need support from listeners like you. For as little as $3 a month, you can help me uh, uh, offset the time spent in putting the program together. Or maybe you just think of it as leaving a tip in the tip jar. Either way, if you can join up, there will be bonuses, like an additional 10 to 15 minute segment with our guest every week, where we'll play additional cues as well as ask uh, some extra questions. And it's going to be only available to patrons. How do you sign up? Well, it's simple. You go to patreon.com slash what's the score, and that's all one word. That's Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash what's the score. Check it out. We'd be grateful for your support. That's Patreon dot com. kind of alluded to it and I'd be curious to find out a little bit more about it. It sounds to me that most of your work has been uh, through the use of electronics instead of live instruments. Um, geez, I don't know what to ask you, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's is that the future? Do you, do you foresee that the future is that most of the film music and TV music that we'll hear will all be electronically uh, produced, or is there a place for live orchestras? 
I think it's. I think they will exist in parallel. Um, I don't think uh, it will ever totally replace live orchestras and live players. I mean, <clears throat> the technology for you know what we call in the box orchestras in the last 10, 15, 20 years has just gotten pretty insane. Uh, you can write some very convincing, awesome music, but honestly, it's one of those things where like I spend so much time writing it. And then when you actually sit down and listen to a score with a real orchestra, you're like, Oh God. Right. Like <laughs> that's how good it sounds. And the other thing is that you are kind of limited by what the software will allow you to do. You know, there are certain, uh, you know, sounds and articulations that sound really good. And then there are some that sound bad. And if they sound bad, I won't, I tend to not use them, which is a frustrating um, place to be in. Um, oh, you know, for example, like I, I will rarely write legato string lines because most of my libraries just don't sound that good. Uh, whereas if I was writing for an orchestra, that's something you could absolutely do if you're writing for real players. The other weird thing that I found is when you write for orchestra for uh, when you were sorry when you write in the box versus for actual players, you're not um, limited by the uh, you know the, the the physics and the ability of the actual players. So you can write some really crazy things that in the real world would not fly, and that. That's that's sort of an interesting skill set. So if I'm writing and I know that players are going to be playing what I'm writing, I will actually write differently than if I'm writing knowing that it's just going to be in the box. And Makes getting sense. and getting it to sound good in the box to me is actually a whole skill set in itself. Like figuring out um, the best parts of the orchestra to highlight and how to mix it and how to how to how to write and how to uh, articulate it. In that that alone, I feel like is an important skill set when writing for TV. Uh, almost the same way I would say that you know, uh, being a great orchestrator for when you're going to be, if you're going to have it played by real musicians, being a great orchestrator, having a great orchestrator, it's it's as important. I would say. Did, did it did it require a lot of special? training to learn to use the software and those sorts of things or was it was or was it intuitive i mean it sounds to me like that might have been well i don't know you tell me you know it's interesting there there are certain standards that have been developed in the software so software world that most composers expect um so once you've mastered a handful of you know once you've mastered a handful of different libraries then if you buy new ones and incorporate them usually it doesn't take too much uh manipulation to to get comfortable with them mm -hmm. um and then what ends up happening too is you end up sort of filling the gaps of what you're capable of so if i have you know these types of strings and i notice i'm constantly wishing i could have these other strings then you'll sort of you'll augment it with this other library that's really good at this other thing and then you'll augment it with horns that are good at this but maybe you get a different library when you want your horns to do this other thing and then figuring out how to make it all sound good together is also you know a whole skill in itself but i don't think i don't think it will ever it'll never sound as good as a real orchestra and what's happening now a lot of the time is you actually get these hybrid cues where often the mixers are mixing in the sampled sort of in the box orchestra with the live one, because mm -hmm. then you get this really, you can, you can get this really out of this world, like big, larger than life sound. You know, I know guys like, you know, Zimmer and Junkie XL, uh, I, they both do that from my, my understanding is that that's something that they do a lot of because the samples, you can do things with the samples that you can't do with a live orchestra to make them just sound completely insane. So when you're doing these crazy Marvel superheroes and you, superhero films and you want the score to just be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, by mixing the two of them, you can actually get some pretty crazy sounds. And, of course, they have the budget to be able to bring in a live orchestra as well. So that's sometimes I'm sure that's a limit on some of the projects you work on. 
Yeah, I mean, it is it is frustrating because the the budget is definitely a limit here. And then also, you know, when you're listening to these, you know, super high-budget Hollywood scores, they've got, you know, the best engineers and the best mixers and the best music editors, and they've got whole teams of guys that are... And, ga- and and women that are that are writing these cues for them, and whereas in Canada it's like, you know, I'm a one stop shop. <laughs> like if yeah. you hire me, I'm writing it, I'm mixing it, I'm delivering it. I do have an assistant that helps me on some projects, but you know, pretty, I'm pretty much doing everything. That's which, a huge job. It is. I mean, it's a lot of work. Sometimes it's frustrating. I wish I could just spend more time actually writing the music and not doing all of the. the well, when you when such. you hit the big time, you can always hire an orchestrator <laughs> and, a, and an arranger and all that sort of stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Which I have, you know, I have had the opportunity to do that, um, a couple times. But in Canada, unfortunately, it's just not the norm with the budgets yeah. that were handed. Huh. It's understandable. It's understandable. Uh, another cue you wanted to highlight is uh, from a project called The Lake. I think it's uh, called Summer of Jane. Tell us a little bit about that cue and why we wanted to include that today to share with our audience. So this is a really funny cue. Um, so The Lake is a show that was on Amazon, or it is on Amazon. Season two is coming out uh, any day this summer. And uh, the music in that, it's very, it's based in pop music. So it's very based in um, pop production. But And s- some of the pop inspiration is from the 90s and then some of it is from you know the 20 the early 2000s and some of it is from now and this particular cue we were highlighting we were basically highlighting the age of this particular character named Jane who's very stuck in the late 90s and so this became kind of her theme song in season one summer of Jane and the idea was we wanted to produce a track that sounded like a full-on Max Martin produced Britney Spears track from 1998. And so I hired uh, a fantastic uh, singer slash friend of mine named uh, Alex Petkovsky, who goes by Fiora. uh, And she wrote the lyrics and sang on it. And uh, it's a hilarious track. And I just think it's, it's very funny. So I wanted to share it. All right. Well, let's have a listen for ourselves. This again from a project called The Lake. And once again, it's written by our guest, Peter Chapman. Lastly, one of the uh, final cues that you wanted to share with the audience today comes, and I'm, something tells me I'm going to butcher the name of this. Guac, uh, let me think of it. Guacamole? Yep. So okay. it's, a, it's a play on uh, guacamole. Right. I figured but, that, yeah. But and, me- melee as in, like, people fighting each other. And did I hear you earlier mention this, that it was a... Was this a video game or no? Yeah. So this is a video game that I worked on. Um, I touched on it earlier. Um, Tell us a little yeah. bit about why you wanted to choose the uh, this particular cue that we're going to share. It's the... Uh, it's the mix, I think, right? No, this is the uh, the guacamole uh, opening menu music. Okay, yeah. So I, I chose this one because it was, to me, it encapsulated the whole sound of of, guaca- of guacamole. So guacamole was a hybrid of um, traditional mariachi and Mexican folk music, hmm. uh, ma- like mashed together with electronic music and kind of uh, 80s and 90s chiptune music. The game itself uh, paid a lot of tribute to a lot of the video games that uh, I grew up playing through use of graphics and inside jokes and storylines that were directly kind of quoting these games. And so I actually got to do, I don't think you hear it in this cue, but if you listen to the whole score, there are moments where I actually quote some of the games that they are quoting musically. So if you listen really closely, you very briefly hear a little bit of the melody from a video game called Metroid. Uh, You hear a little bit of a Mario theme. There's like a bunch of these little melodies that I kind of weave in as a little bit of a wink (laughs) to the people uh, of my generation that that grew up. But this one is just like a very uh, heroic 
um, exciting kind of um, opening music cue that plays uh, as soon as you turn the game on. So excellent, excellent. Well, let's, uh, let's have a listen for ourselves. Wakamele, right? Yep, that's right. Here's the project that it comes from. It's a video game. And uh, once again, it's written by our guest, Peter Chapman. Peter, as we uh, kind of wrap things up, I'm kind of curious if people are interested. How do they uh, kind of find out about what you've got going on and uh, what you're doing and how do they follow you? I mean, I'm assuming you have a social media presence. Yeah. Um, if you uh, if you go on Instagram, that, I seem to be most active on Instagram these days. Um, if you look up uh, Peter Chapman Music. Okay. Um, it's Peter underscore Chapman underscore music. I'm on there usually posting about stuff that I'm working on or things I'm doing or little clips from my studio. Um, I am on Twitter as Peter Chapman Esquire, but I don't really use it that much. And, and uh, any kind of a project coming down the pike that you want to highlight? Um, I mean, there's a few things coming. There's uh, season two of SkyMed is about to get started, so I'm pretty excited about that. Work and Moms, the season finale, uh, just went up on Netflix this week, and so that is something I'm very proud of. That was a really fun show to work on, and I'm, it's very bittersweet that it's uh, that it's ending. I'm pretty sad about that. Um, and yeah, and if you've you know got kids under the age of nine, I would highly recommend uh, checking out the Happy House of Frightenstein on YouTube. Okay. Um, they're little seven-minute episodes. I show them to my kids, and they love them. And, uh, yeah, other than that, I can't really talk about the other things that I'm working yeah, on. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's, that's understandable. But it's good It's good to know you've got things in the pipeline and you're staying busy. And uh, <clears throat> because of that, I'm really grateful for you taking the time to talk with us today and to kind of share with us a little bit about your insights into the film scoring world as well as some of the music that you've uh, that you've composed. Uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. I hope you've enjoyed it. Absolutely. This was great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Listen, uh, again, make sure you, uh, uh, when you listen to this music, and if you like it, you should follow him on uh, Instagram, and uh, we'll try to post that on our Facebook page as well. Peter, once again, our thanks for you joining us uh, today on the program, and my thanks to uh, all our listeners, and in particular our patrons who listen and uh, support the program through patreon.com. And uh, I guess there's only one thing left to say at this point, and that's simply this, that my name is Frank R. Wilson. My time's up. I thank you for yours. Thanks for listening to What's the Score. <laughs>